Good morning. Welcome to worship at First Presbyterian Church of Columbus, Georgia. We're glad that you're here to join us as we worship God by offering our prayers and singing songs and listening to scripture. Please come in with us that we may worship God together. The first reading comes from the book of Jeremiah in the Old Testament. Let us listen that we may hear what God will share with us. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to one another, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least to the greatest, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. The word of the Lord. The New Testament reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew. Let us listen that we may hear what God will share with us. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And the second um, is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all of the law and the prophets. The word of the Lord. The last Sunday of October is known around the world in the Protestant world as Reformation Sunday. It is the Sunday when we gather to and acknowledge the uh, power of the historical movement called the Reformation. This year marks the, five, the 500th anniversary of that movement. It's when Martin Luther went to his university um, doorway and posted theses for debate, because that's what they did in those days, sort of the equivalent of social media in our own day and time. And from that debate came a lot of change and a lot of conflict and a lot of conversation, and we're here because of it. 300 years ago, in 1717, Philadelphia Presbytery was founded, and that's significant because all Presbyterians in the United States trace our legacy back to Philadelphia Presbytery. Regardless of what alphabet soup you use to identify your denomination, ARP, PCUSA, um, whatever it is, it goes back to Philadelphia Presbytery. I'm not thinking any of us were here for either the 300th anniversary or the 500th anniversary. We're, we weren't there. Let me rephrase that. We are here for the anniversary. We weren't, we weren't there then. If you were there in 1717 or 1517, let me know later on because that's something to, to, to note. But we weren't there. But this is also the 30th anniversary of the founding of what's called Flint River Presbytery. Presbyterians organize congregations and then congregations coalesce in regions, and the region that we're in is called Flint River Presbytery. It stretches from Columbus east to Macon, south to Valdosta, over to Bainbridge and back up the Alabama line. So within our little corner of southwest Georgia, there are middle and southwest Georgia, there are some 47 Presbyterian churches in our presbytery. And we work together to do mission and to do things together. But this particular organization wasn't, has only been around since 1987. 
Organizations come and go, but this organization's been there for that long. And when you think about it, 30 years is not that long. I mean, a lot of us in this room were alive in 1987, but some were not. Or some were in elementary school or high school. Some people 30 years ago had already been teaching Sunday school for 30 years, and others were finding their way, dealing with first children or first jobs or other startup activities in life. 30 years ago, in some ways, doesn't seem that long, but yet it is a good marker. Consider what wasn't here 30 years ago. 1987, the very first Disney store opened. That's a hallmark, you know? If you have children of a certain age, you know that's a hallmark. Chipotle did not appear until the 1990s. Tickle Me Elmo was the craze at Christmas 1996. Pre-made peanut butter and jelly sandwiches appeared only in the year 2000. Can you imagine that? Thank you, Smuckers. Google wasn't here. They came along in 1997. Facebook in 2001. Facebook in 2004. Wikipedia in 2001. And Elf on the Shelf came into our Christmas vocabulary in 2005. And of course, these things were not known 30 years ago. But maybe nothing says how far we've come in 30 years than the fact that in 1987, for the first time, Prozac was marketed. Yeah. We've come a long way. There's a lot of stuff that is here today that wasn't here, and we just take it for granted. 35 years ago, in this very room, was the very last was, was the last freestanding General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church in the United States, so the so-called Southern Presbyterian Church. And in this room, representatives from around this denomination voted to ask and to move forward with a plan for reunion with the Northern Presbyterian Church. The next year in Atlanta, that was finalized. But from this place, in this space, that plan was propelled. It wasn't, it wasn't a spur-of-the-moment action. It had taken place over a long period of time, but it, it happened. The whole point is that we are connected in ways that we might not even realize and understand. Part of our heritage is not only change and transition, but part of our heritage is, is, is conflict and argument and debate. I am fond of saying there, where there are two Presbyterians, there are at least three opinions, and we argue about lots of things in the Presbyterian Church. In recent years, the larger, the larger church has debated what are the essential tenets of the Reformed faith. What are the core beliefs of that? And there's been some of that that we have felt close to home. But that debate is not new. That argument is not new. In 1727, 290 years ago, the presbyteries of that time adopted the Westminster Confession of Faith as the standard of, of, to express faith. And the question was, the reason they did that was they were debating the nature of predestination. How do we know when we're saved? How do we know when we're sanctified? What does that mean to be justified? And the answers that they looked for then were found in the Westminster Confession of Faith, which we still reference and use. And are, but the questions didn't go away simply because answers were given. Questions persisted. In the 18th and 19th century, our nation experienced a couple of great awakenings. Our Presbyterian ancestor, Gilbert Tennant, was a firebrand of a, a, a preacher, and he argued that there were dangers in an unconverted ministry. He founded 
a school which became known as the College of New Jersey, which gave birth to the Princeton University, to teach pastors how to serve. But his view was not universally accepted, and in fact, there was a division within churches and within the presbyteries of the time. In the 19th century, there was another division. It was, it was over a couple of different arguments. One was, was it appropriate for independent mission societies to work in conjunction with the church for promoting the gospel, or was the work of sharing God's good news solely an ecclesiastical function of the church? Now, that may not sound like a huge issue, but if you think about it, today we take for granted that there's a partnership between church or church, the church, quote-unquote, and organizations that promote various means of sharing God's message. We take that for granted, but that was not always what it was, and it caused a split. And it also fell into the other things that were involved in there. There were new measures such as the revival in mass media, which in that day meant could you put a newspaper ad promoting a revival or should you just trust that the people who needed to show up would show up? That was the debate that was going on. And it split churches and presbyteries and organizations. From early days in our nation's history, long before we had a nation, even when we were colonies, there, was, there were arguments over chattel slavery. Indeed, the use of enslaved labor has been the bedrock or was the bedrock for a long time for our, our nation and what became our nation. Samuel Davies was a Presbyterian pastor in Virginia in the 1700s, and he, he felt a calling to go and share the gospel with the enslaved communities, and so he went and asked plantation owners, and some let him, others did not. In the 1800s, Charles Stillman in Alabama worked with enslaved peoples and later with new freed peoples to create schools and churches. Both of these men and many others besides them and women who worked with them, these folks were doing this from their position of privilege. They were privileged to be able to share this news, and they also felt some form of paternalism as they did it. That is not to condemn them, it's just to say that was the place from which they sat. At the same time they were doing this, there were other African Americans leaders in the Presbyterian Church. John Gloucester, who founded the first African American Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia in the 1780s and 90s, and John Chavis, who was a freed person of color in North Carolina, and he provided a witness to develop congregations and to do evangelization among the enslaved populations in North Carolina. When you walk around Uptown Columbus, you will see historical markers, wonderful historical markers. If you go to the corner of 14th Street and veterans, you will see that a marker that notes that Columbus was the uh, last land battle in the Civil War before uh, the truce was signed. Easter Sunday, 1865. If you walk up First Avenue a couple of blocks, you will see a sign for that notes the, uh, the development of the first black public school in this city, in county. Just down First Avenue toward the Abbey, where we have our college ministry, there's a marker about the office of Dr. Thomas Brewer, who was a black physician and a civil rights advocate in the 1940s and 50s, and it notes that he was killed by gunshots in 1956. These things happen close by to us, 
So conflict and division and argumentation about theological and social issues is not something that we are alien from. It's not something that we are without. It happens all the time, and it's around us, and it's part of our, part of our, our life and our, our, our story. It is part of the heritage that we celebrate. But when we say we celebrate heritage, we need to be careful not to, to note that we are not excluding other people. There are lots of folks in our circles who are part of our religious development and background. There are lots of people in our circles who we share community life with, maybe sometimes even family life with, where we have conflict and, and division. The Scripture speaks to us about how to confront those situations. How is it that we live in this world that is very torn, that is very divided? How do we live in this world in a way that makes sense out of it, in a way that finds movement forward? The answer both from Jeremiah and from Jesus' words in Matthew is that sometimes, well, not just sometimes, we can look and see what is to be new from what is old. Jeremiah says to the children of Israel as they are caught up in the difficulties of, of, of exile and, and challenge, Jeremiah says, the Lord will give you a new covenant. The Lord will reaffirm and, and give you something new and different. The Lord will write this covenant in your heart, not just on paper, not just on tablets, but in your heart. The message translation uses the words engraved. We don't do a lot of engraving these days, but if you have ever had something that was engraved, you, you can pick it up and you can feel the texture. Think about that, feeling God's word of love and goodness and grace to you as being the texture within your heart. Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? And he hearkens back to Deuteronomy 6, 5, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul and all your might. And then he says, the second comes from Leviticus 19, 18, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Those two things, those two principles, laws, those are the essentials that we struggle with. And we lift those up, love God and love neighbor. Those form the base for where we are to go forward. We are not to find them simply by going back. We've got to go forward with what we have now achieved. What was old becomes new. How we live we live in a time when there are lots of different challenges to our life. In our faith and in our community and in our nation, there are lots of different challenges that we see and we struggle with. To some degree, you, you might even want to say that lots of all these issues that, that are out there, political, economic, matters of race and class and gender, all of those are about power. And who has power? and how power is used. God's word to us through Jesus is that the power of love is going to be the power that cuts through all those others. The power of love is not simply affection, it is not simply companionship. The power of love is the power of God's presence. It transforms who we are from what we have been to what we can be in the future. As we struggle with any and all challenges that come to us, whether or not we are male or female, black or white, Asian or Hispanic, whether or not we live uh, wherever we live, however we live, 
All of those things, God's power of love cuts through and transforms and changes us. That was the hope by which the children of Israel lived. That was the way in which Jesus shared to the Pharisees what was possible. That is really what the Protestant Reformation was attempting to get at. And that is where we are today. We can look back and be thankful for what has been. We also must look forward to take that power of love of God and love of neighbor into the future to transform ourselves so that as we live and generations come after us, they will be able to look back on us to see their way forward again as well. What was old does become new. Thanks be to God. Amen. It's been a privilege to join you this day in worship. We're glad that you were here. First Presbyterian Church seeks to serve and minister in the name of Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be kind and gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor. Go in peace as you love and serve God.